led me out of the desert, brought me into his streams, river of living water, turned my bitter into sweet, and all my burdens are lifted, took the shackles off my feet, but there's no sound louder than a captive set free, amen, so let the redeemed of the Lord say, his promises evermore pour out your thankfulness let it overflow let the redeemed of the Lord say so give him a shot of praise there is joy in the morning springing up in my soul there's life worth living Cause he calls me his own And there's a hallelujah After sweet victory There's no sound louder than A captive set free Oh, there's no sound louder than A captive set free So let the redeemed of the Lord say so Sing of his promises Evermore, pour out your thankfulness, let it overflow, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen, let the redeemed say so. You are my deliverer, freedom I'm living in. You are my deliverer, you are my promised land. You are my deliverer, the freedom I'm living in. You are my deliverer, you are my promised land. You are my deliverer, the freedom I'm living in. You are my deliverer, you are my promised land. Oh, you are my deliverer, the freedom I'm living in. God, you are my Deliverer, you are my promised land So that the redeemed of the Lord say so Sing of His promises evermore Pour out your thankfulness Let it overflow That the redeemed of the Lord Redeemed, amen. We haven't done this one in a while. We need you guys' help on this one. Holy is the Lord, amen. And he is worthy to be praised. Stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He Together we sing And everyone sing Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His glory. We stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength yes it is amen 
we bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. And together we sing. And everyone sing. Whoa, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with
also thank you for your ongoing faithfulness in giving. You can actually give in three different ways. Simply go to the description portion of this video on YouTube and click on the giving link. This will take you to our website. From there, you can give securely through PayPal. There is no account required. Or you can also download the Givelify app, find Living Faith Church, Exelon, Wisconsin, or simply mail a check or money order to Living Faith Church. P.O. Box 65, Exelon, Wisconsin, 54835. Please remember to pray for our nation and our leaders, along with our LFC missions families in Tanzania, Africa, India, Mexico, and Honduras. Thanks, everyone. If you don't know me, my name is Chris. I'm Pastor Tim's uh, son, firstborn. Um, I grew up in this church, and um, I'm, just, I'm just encouraged to see all the godly men serving the Lord. Um, you know, a lot of you, and, and women too, um, seeing this, Kodiak too grew up in this church, and uh, many of you that I've seen throughout my life have been a prime example how I should live a godly life. It wasn't only Pastor Tim, you know, but I've seen Pastor Harlow, Kodiak, Pastor Craig, Rick, uh, and Ava, Sophie, my grandma. Um, you guys are an encouragement to the young generation. How many of you know this young generation needs guidance and it needs discipline? They, they are completely lost, but it, it, one of the things that I, I, I remember is that young Young people, what their glory is, is what their energy is, is their zeal for God. And one of the things that I hold to is, is my zeal for God. 
And I say, when the older generation, it's, it goes hand in hand. The younger generation has the zeal and the older generation has the wisdom. Together, that is the body of Christ working together. So I, I just encourage you, if you're, if you're young, to have zeal for God, energy. That's, that's our strength. If you're old, older, excuse me. <laughs> I'll tread lightly. Um, if you're older, find somebody to, to disciple because really, you know, if you see somebody that is... Um, needs discipling, which we do, um, you know, it says a wise man hears a rebuke and increases in learning. And I said, if I'm wise, I'll just continue to listen and correct my steps. Amen. And I'm just, you know, I'm encouraged and I just thank you all for your faithfulness. And it's an honor to be here to share the word with you this morning. Um, I, uh, I'm encouraged to hear Kodiak back from Ramah. Uh, the spirit of the Lord is on him. And that was a great sermon the other week that he preached. Um, it's just amazing when you see somebody grow up in the church and they don't fall away from the faith. I mean, we have a great backsliding right now in America that's going on and it needs to be addressed. And when you see somebody that's stayed with the word and gone off to school to be a minister, that's amazing. That's a testimony in of itself right there. That's the glory of God shining. And we need to recognize that because we want our children to grow up in the word and not depart from the faith, amen? Amen. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul, and I think of 2 Timothy, I think probably one of my favorite books of the Bible, 2 Timothy, Paul speaking to Timothy, a young pastor, encourages him, says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. And I say, that's not only to young pastors, that's to the body of Christ, that we need to be ready to preach the word in season and out of season. Um, you know, growing up in this church, I've seen many that have exampled their faith walk for me, and it's, it's been such a blessing. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. How many of you know we need a good report right now? The church, if there was a scoreboard, the church, in my estimation, would be losing the battle. 1 John 5, 4 says, For whatsoever is born of God has overcome the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Not in ourselves and our good works, but our faith in Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross for us. Um, you know, I was thinking about what to call this sermon, and I said, should I call it faith? I mean, we are a living faith church, or should I call it victory? And I started thinking about it, and I said, well, you know, it's kind of hard to have faith biblical, true faith without walking in victory. And it's kind of hard to have victory without walking in faith, amen? And so I said they go hand in hand together, but if you are walking in biblical faith, you have the victory in God's eyes, amen? Maybe not in man's eyes, but in God's eyes, you're being obedient to what he's called you to do. You're running your race with diligence. I just, I'm encouraged by that, um, that clip that we were shown, um, how we're supposed to lay aside every weight and hindrance of, of sin so that we can run our race with endurance, right? There's a race that is set before you that you're going to have to run. Um, the definition of faith is full assurance or relying, relying on. You know, a, a good example of faith would, is if I'm looking at you right now, I can see that you have a full assurance faith relying and trusting in those chairs that you're sitting. Not because you told me, it's because I see that all your weight is upon it right now. None of you are looking like you're going to get up and boogie on out of here. But that is our faith. Our actions will demonstrate our faith, just like it says in James. Um, you know, as I studied faith, faith is really a huge subject. There's just so many times that the Bible mentions faith. Actually, it mentions it 336 times in the New Testament. And everything that we do in God's kingdom, there's going to be an aspect of faith. You know, if you think about it, we put faith in every single thing that throughout our day, even unbelievers, they put faith into the car that they drive to work. They put faith in, for instance, the food that they eat, knowing that, you know, it could make you sick, but they have faith that it's not going to make you sick. I mean, we put faith into tons of things, but in God's kingdom, this element of faith, this is really what God's kingdom works on is, is faith. Um, I want to turn to a passage, Revelation Chapter 12, 11. If you have a Bible this morning, um, the ushers have extra Bibles. You guys got extra Bibles back there. Um, they'll give you a Bible. 
if you don't bring a Bible, there is the Bible app on your phone. It's really handy. I use it all the time. Um, and there's so many translations that you can use. But how, how many of you know it's good to let your eyes rest on the words of life on the Bible, amen? To see what it actually says to, you know, I might say some things that don't sound right. Hopefully I say everything that sounds right. But we need a measuring stick. We need to measure up what our pastors and preachers are teaching today in the, the churches with the ultimate word of God. Um, Revelation twelve eleven. I said, um, I if I can turn to it. Revelation twelve eleven, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto death. I really started dwelling on this in the past uh, months, but think about this: they overcame him. Who overcame? Christians overcame Satan by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto death. That's three things right there that will place us into having victory, right? And what's the first thing is they overcame by the blood of the lamb. Well, what's the blood of the lamb? Being born again. You're washed clean by Jesus Christ. You've, you've made that commitment to walk in him, being really what we call born again. The word of their testimony. What is that? Your testimony. And not only that, but speaking the word of God. What's the greatest weapon that the believer has today? Our mouth, our word, right? We're speaking the word, right? And that's the one thing that the enemy does not want us to do is speak the word. I think that believers in America need to do a whole lot more speaking of the word and less of man's word, amen? And the third thing is they love not their lives unto death. They counted the cost, what it means to be a true believer in Jesus Christ. They don't have one foot over here in the world and one foot in the church, they're fully surrendered to Jesus Christ. And when you think about that, one, one foot in the world and one foot in the church really makes no sense because both feet are off the rock of Jesus Christ. That's really where we need to be set, right there. Um, you know, as I look at this, we need victory in the church today. And I want, I mean, as I look through the word, there's so many examples that the word gives us, do this, do this, do this, this is the outcome. Do this, do this, this is the outcome. If you don't do this and you fail to do this, unfortunately, this will be the outcome. It's so practical. God's word is so practical. When I look at it, it's practical. It's easy to understand. But the thing about it is that as you start studying God's word, the depth of God's word is just so much. If you start studying any subject in the Bible, you go, okay, I'm gonna study, you know, Riley's, talking about finances. I'm going to study what it means to be a cheerful giver and give unto the Lord. Oh, man, you start studying that, it's just, you can comprehend it, but it's just so deep. You know, a lot of people, they think that, you know, I just need a 12-step program or, you know, I need a three-step. Got it right here. They overcame by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto death. Three things right there. If you do these, you're going to have victory, right? Amen? Can you hand me my water real quick? Um, so, you know, we have this example in, in, in James 4. Thank you. How do you overcome Satan? You overcome Satan by submitting to God, resist the devil, and what a, he'll flee from you. That's two things. Proverbs chapter 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Submit or acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will what? Direct your paths, right? Mark chapter eight, Jesus says, if you wanna be my disciple or if you wanna follow me, you must what? Deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. Three things right there. It's so simple. This is so simple. My children get this. When I teach them spiritual truth, my children get this. It's so simple. God's word is completely simple. He's not hiding his will. Ephesians chapter five, it says, we need to redeem the time because the days are evil. The days are evil. And God's not hiding his word. He's not trying to make things complicated. Remember what Jesus said, the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. We got short time right now, then we're out of here. This should be an alarm going off in us. But I wanna talk about the first step is 
the blood of the lamb. They overcame Satan by the blood of the lamb. First Peter chapter one, verse 18, it says, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. What is Peter talking about? He's talking about being born again. We're not redeemed with the things of this world. We're bought back. Redeemed means being bought back. Restored with what? The precious blood of Jesus Christ. You've heard the saying, you know, like remember that old MasterCard commercial that said priceless? I can't remember exactly how it went. But the blood of Jesus Christ, there's not a price you can put on it. And as Riley was saying, everything is the Lord's. We're just stewards of it. He bought us back. Um, John 3.3, 3, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so when we think about this, I mean, you start looking at it like, okay, are you talking about being born again? This is pretty elementary. You'll be amazed how much How many professing Christians, when I talk to them, don't know what being born again really means? This is elementary. This is nuts and bolts of Christianity, and they don't know it. Very alarming. But this is what uh, Jesus says. He says that you need to be born again. A new heart, new desires. You've recognized that you've sinned against God. Um, I want to look into this a little bit closer. If you want to turn into Romans 10... And you could, you could hold your place in Revelation 12. Uh, I might be back there, but Romans 10. I really love this passage. I memorized it in the New King James. I'm uh, reading out of the King James right now, so I might biff it a couple of times. The New King James is a little easier reading. Um, Romans 10, Paul speaking here. And I'm just going to start with verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. For Moses describes the righteousness which is of the law that the man which does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaks on this wise, say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is near thee in thine heart and in thy mouth. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if you confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou, you, shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What we have right here is commonly known as the sinner's prayer, calling on the name of the Lord. If I talk to people that uh, profess to know Christ, oftentimes they'll say, yeah, I've prayed the prayer. But really what they don't know is what they're praying. And this is the confession, what Paul is saying right here, that professing Jesus Christ as Lord, confessing our sins from our heart. We believe something, therefore we speak it with our mouth right? This is a kingdom principle that we need to get for everything. And I'm going to show you, I'm going to prove it by the word. I want to look at chapter, or uh, verse 4 here, Romans 10, verse 4. It says, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Think about this. Christ gives us his moral law, his Ten Commandments, right? The moral law, the Ten Commandments, has carried over into the New Covenant, the Old Covenant, the Ten Commandments, had branching off of that dietary laws, animal sacrifices, new moons, observing new moons and Sabbaths. These things have fallen off. The law of righteousness, which is Christ in us, this is carried over to the New Covenant. And so 
Seeing this, you know, this is what Paul talks about with the church of Galatia. He says, you who try to be righteous underneath the law, try to be not the Ten Commandments, the old covenant, who obtain righteousness through that, you've fallen from grace and you make Christ no effect in your lives. But Christ is the end of the law. What is, it says, the law is good if it's used what? Lawfully. Lawfully to point us to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only way. If I believe anything else, it will perish. The two builders, the one on the sandy ground, the one on the rock. The one on the rock is on Jesus Christ. The one on the sandy ground is on a whole lot of other things. But Christ is the end of the law. How I bring somebody to Christ, how I talk to them, are you born again? Very simple, very easy. Actually, the easiest way to find out if someone's born again is ask them if they're born again. <laughs> what is that? You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself a graven image. Do not, uh, don't use the Lord's name in vain. Keep the Sabbath holy. Honor your father, father and mother. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not lie. Don't covet your neighbor's belongings, Right? or his wife. And see, this is shines in. Remember, Paul said, I would have not known sin, but by the law, the law of righteousness, the law of Christ. It points us to Christ. And there's nothing that we can do to obtain eternal salvation apart from Jesus Christ. One of the things is that we've heard, you know, sometimes people say, well, you know, they, uh, you know, they came to Christ and they, they don't always have to have the law preached to them. We've heard law to the proud, grace to the humble. And I say, yeah, but somewhere down the line, they would have had to hear the gospel, right? Because they got to know what they're repenting of. They got to know what they're needing a new heart. You see, the cure to cancer, you're not going to know, um, you know, if I said I had the cure to cancer and you didn't know that you had the disease, I'd seem pretty foolish for giving you the cure when you don't know that you have the disease. That's what the law does. It exposes our conscience. And so somewhere down the line, they would have had to heard the gospel. And so when you think about it, the law to the proud, grace to the humble, it's actually not even in the Bible. What it actually says is, God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. So the only way that the human heart is going to be humble is by the law of Christ. You might not need to preach Christ in that moment because they've already heard it. But somewhere down the line, they would have needed to hear the gospel saving message. The first thing that came out of Jesus' mouth when he started his ministry, excuse me, ministry, was what? Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent. Very simple, very easy. Like I said, a child can get this because this is what Jesus Christ revealed himself as. Um, so believe in the gospel. And what it, you believe in the gospel and you speak with your mouth. See, when I was living a life of sin, fornication, idolatry, drunkenness, perversion, running from God in rebellion. It wasn't the goodness of God that turned me back to him. It was the fear of the Lord. So the conviction of the Holy Spirit came upon me and the process of redemption took place. And that was very quick. What was it? I was convicted in my heart, got down on my knees. And I said, Lord, forgive me. I've sinned against you. I pray that you'd give me a new heart, new desires. For with the heart, Man believes unto righteousness. The mouth confession is made unto salvation. See, this is a kingdom principle and it works for anything. It works for really everything in God's kingdom and I'll, I'll prove it out. Um, you know, we see this example with salvation for the thief on the cross. You know, the two thieves that were next to Jesus, Jesus is on the cross and the one thief is blaspheming his name. And the other thief says, Lord, remember me in your kingdom. And he says, today you will be with me in paradise. There's nothing that he could do. You know, I, I say this, you know, um, you know, Catholics, he couldn't go take of the Eucharist. He couldn't go to mass. Jehovah's Witnesses, he couldn't go knock on a door. You know, uh, LDS, Mormons, you know, he couldn't go out and do a bunch of works. He's nailed to a cross. God sees the heart. Man sees the outward appearance. There was a transaction that was taking place. The fresh blood of Jesus Christ was washing his sins away. I think that's beautiful when we look at that. It's just amazing what God has done under the new covenant and to recognize that. So what you believe is what you're gonna speak, amen? What you believe, if you believe the Lord, you'll speak the things of the Lord. If you believe the word, you'll speak the word. If you don't believe the word, you're not gonna speak this. Um, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. This is a direct indication whether or not someone's born again. I can tell instantly 
whether if they're born again. Just talking to them. By their fruits, you shall know them. Right? No good tree bears forth bad fruit. No bad tree bears forth good fruit. We want to bear fruit for God's kingdom. Amen? The time is short. We're going to redeem the time. Um, Many in the modern day church don't know this. So think of it this way. If you know this and the Holy Spirit is in you, we have an obligation to let our light shine, amen? We have an obligation to reach the lost. Um, you know, it's, it's not always the most appealing work, but I thank God that um, he's counted me faithful enabling me into the ministry. And I thank God that he's put this in me and that I know the truth and that the truth has set me free. How privileged I am to know the truth. So many people um, go throughout their whole lives, they'll never know the truth. Maybe God's knocking at their heart, but they'll never know the truth. And so this is what you have, redemption versus sanctification. We're redeemed quick. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us of our sin. But here's where the, the hiccup comes in. Ephesians 2.8 says, We're saved by grace through faith, that not of ourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Right? And so what's wrenched over here on the other side is James chapter 2, verse 17, faith without works is dead. Right? And so they say there's a conflict. I say, no, there's never a conflict in Scripture. All Scripture goes together like this. Scripture goes hand in hand. We just need to realize what it's saying. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from our sin. But our works will be evident that we have a new heart in Jesus Christ. Amen? And so when I gave my life to Jesus, I said, okay, I'm going to make this declaration of faith. I believe it in my heart. I proclaim it with my mouth. I thank you, God, that you're the Lord of my life. Next day, I was questioned at work. Why, what's going on with Chris? I said, I've given my life to Jesus Christ. Aha, uh-huh, here's works. It's not works of the church or the physical aspects. It's bearing fruit of righteousness. What does John the Baptist say? He says, when the, when the Pharisees came to him, he says, you brood of vipers, who told you to flee from the wrath to come? And he says, bear fruits unto repentance, right? Repentance is good, and we need it. The church needs it, amen? I think that's why we have so many people falling away is because they, uh, they've never been redeemed. They've never had that conversion of giving their lives, that brokenness where the law has pointed them to Christ. They say, you're wretched, you're miserable. Without Christ, you will perish. And so we have a bunch of people and the church has got the cart before the horse and they've taken out redemption and they've put in sanctification. And you're trying to sanctify a bunch of people that have never submitted their lives to Christ. They don't have the blood of Jesus Christ surrounding them and that has cleansed their sin, right? Remember the old covenant? They took hyssop, put it over their doorpost and the spirit of death didn't hit their house. It wasn't because they were Hebrews, because there was an action of faith that they believed and they applied the blood. That's what we need for a cleansing in us. And that's what the world needs to hear is the blood of Jesus Christ. There's nothing else that can get us to heaven. Amen? You know, false redemption, baptism, prayer, church attendance, works ministry, that's nice, but you, it's, it will not last in this world. The only thing that will last is when the winds and the rain and the floods came and they beat on the side of the house. Remember which house stood? The rock. The house that was founded on the rock. I want to move to the, my next step. Uh, I'll try to move this along fairly quick. Um, step two, the word of our testimony. Your testimony is an open, dec- open declaration of your faith. Like I said, the biggest weapon the believer has is the mouth and speaking God's word. How can you witness to somebody? someone is simply by sharing your testimony to them, what God's done in your life. It's like the most direct, indirect way of sharing your faith, of just saying what the Lord has done, and it will bring conviction on them, and that's what we want. But also just speaking the word. 2 Corinthians 4.13, we have, we having the same spirit of faith according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Colossians chapter two, verses six and seven. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. I wanna make mention of this. Colossians chapter two, verses six. 
It says, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him. So as you receive Jesus, you say, the conviction of the Holy Spirit came on me. I believe with my heart and I proclaim with my mouth. Right here, this, he says, as you have received Christ Jesus. How did you do that? You believed on righteousness and you confessed with your mouth. And that's how we're supposed to operate in God's kingdom. Continuing to profess God's goodness and his mercy and his judgment to come. Just as Christ has walked on this earth for us, he's a prime example how we should be walking. He who says he abides in him ought himself to walk as Jesus Christ walked, amen? He's the prime example. He was flawless. And he did everything for us to be able to know what to do in situations, how to use our faith, how to pray, how to, how to um, live a godly life. You know, look at the words of Jesus. He rebuked the fever, Peter's mother-in-law. He said to the wind and the waves, be calm, be still. Remember the woman with the issue of blood, your faith has made you whole. The Bible tells us how to walk and it's, just, it's more than just salvation. The Bible tells us for healing, deliverance, finances, marriage, raising your children. That's a huge one. As I've recognized this, um, you know, I started teaching, we started teaching our, our kids more spiritual truths than stories. I think this is a huge hiccup in churches because we try to put these stories into kids and they just, there's, you know, I forget stories. I don't know about you, but I forget details and stories and I have to hear it over and over and over and over and over and over. And eventually, you know, if I'm not hearing that on a daily basis, you know, or on a regular basis, I forget what story, how it went. But you know what? kids comprehend is spiritual truths. You know, I, I, um, I uh, was talking to CJ and, and, and my daughter, Lila, and I said to him, I said, you know, you're either going to walk in the flesh or you're going to walk in the spirit. And uh, Rachel's kind of laughing at this one, but, you know, and, and I said, if you're walking in the flesh, you're going to do those things that are not right. You're going to say bad things you're going to be disobedient, you're going to lie. But if you're walking in the spirit, you're going to do those things that are right. You're going to say nice things to each other. You're going to do those things that are, are uh, obedient to, to God. And so I get home one day and I was, <laughs> I was like, uh, CJ, you know, I, I come home and I hear the report of mom, whether or not the kids are good, you know. And so I say, um, you know, how, how were they? And she goes, well, CJ, why don't you tell dad? And so I go, how were you? He's like, well, I was uh, walking in the flesh. I go, oh. <laughs> I, say, I say, oh, were you walking in the flesh? And he goes, well, I was walking in the spirit. I said, oh, were you walking in the spirit? And he goes, well, actually, I was mixing a little bit of both. <laughs> I just thought that was kind of funny. But they pick up on it. And this is what we need to teach. <laughs> I know, he's a funny guy. Um, but this is what we need. We need to teach first the basic elementary principles of Christ. And this is the nuts and bolts of Christianity. If you take out the foundation, you're not going to have your structure. It's going to fall. Sharing the gospel takes faith. There's always an element of faith that I have to have to share the gospel. There's always a spirit of fear that I have to overcome. Spirit of rejection. Spirit of failure. But I thank God, the greater one lives inside of me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All things for Christ's purpose and his kingdom I can do, right? The Bible tells us how to have faith. Um, Romans 12, 3, God has dealt to every man a measure or the measure of faith, right? He's given you a measure of faith. We need to walk in that faith and be obedient. It's up to us what we do with it. Um, Mark 11 22, I'm going to flip over here real quick. Um, Mark eleven twenty two, and this is um, really amazing. I really love this passage, but um, any of you know Kenneth Hagin? Kenneth Hagin is a, a pastor that has, um, he's passed away. I thought it was 2003 that he passed away. Um, but now Kenneth Hagin Jr. is the pastor of Rama Bible Church down in Tulsa. And that's where Kodiak has gone to school for the past three years. Pastor Tim has gone to that school. Pastor Harlow has gone to that school as well and his wife. Um, and really, Kenneth Hagin talks about this passage 
Um, and he really exposed this passage to the church, which was, I think, really, uh, it was breakthrough because the church needed to hear how to walk in faith. And there was a lot of things that came out about this that were, you know, prosperity, name it and proclaim it. But this was huge for the church to have victory. There was a lot of victory, I believe, won through this. Um, you know, Kenneth Hagin talks about his, you know, growing up in his... Uh, being on his deathbed, you know, ministers coming to him and just, you know, saying, oh, it's going to be okay, you'll get through it. Um, but he found this passage, what we're going to read, and he just started proclaiming it and believing in his heart that it was true, as God's word is always true. And so right after Jesus got done rebuking the fig tree, Mark eleven twenty two, and Jesus answering saith unto them, have faith in God. Hebrews eleven six says, without faith it is impossible, impossible to please God. In verse 23, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, Whatsoever things ye desire, when ye pray, believe that you receive them, and ye shall have them. So, right here, this is this is amazing because we know that God not only bought our redemption he he sanctified us but our healing our finances every aspect of our life God has given us the tools that we need to be victorious in this life and he says have faith in God if you, whoever says to this mountain be removed and cast in the sea and does not doubt in his heart but believes those things that he says he will have whatever he says that's three times it mentions says in there and that's our part we can't leave up to God what he's left up to us. We need to be faithful in that and proclaim the word. There's a lot the Bible has to do about speaking. I want to be on that speaking end. Um, so as we believe this, faith in God, what faith is, is just believing God's word that he'll do what he said he's going to do. It's simple, so simple. Religion has complicated it, but God, I believe that you provide you, you supply all my needs according to the riches of your glory in Christ Jesus. Thank you, God, that um, your spirit dwells in me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Thank you, Jesus, that um, you, you, you continue to provide for me. And um, even though a 1,000 may fall at my left hand, 10,000 at my right, you are there with me. I will not fall, amen? And so we need to remember the promises of God as we quote scripture and go on scripture. Um, I want to go to Luke 7, and this is looking at a centurion's faith. Now, remember I said this is the kingdom principle that is operating, believing in your heart and speaking with your mouth. I hope I'm not going too fast this morning, but um, I pray that you get this. I pray that we all get this. I pray that we're benefited. I pray that we're built up today and strengthened in the Holy Spirit that we can do what God's called us to do. Chapter 7, Luke chapter 7, now, when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. And a certain centurion's servant, who was dear unto him, was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loved our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue." Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou should comest, that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Now right here we have scripture, translating scripture. Why, why did he say that? Well, for one thing, I, 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 anytime the, the Bible, a lot of times when the Bible is mentioned centurion soldiers, it's, it's actually in a good light. It's actually in a light that, you know, the centurion soldier at the foot of the cross, you know, he said, surely this man was the son of God. It was always in a, you know, Cornelius. You know, when Peter went to Cornelius, the centurion soldier, um, you know, it was for salvation, you know. And so I think about that. Um, this centurion soldier was humble. He was humble and he recognized that he wasn't worthy. But in Acts chapter 10, verses 28, when Peter went to Cornelius, the other centurion soldier, 
It says, and he said unto them, ye know how that it is unlawful, is, it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come un, unto one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So not only did this man know that it was unlawful for a Jew to enter into another man's house that wasn't a Jew, I feel that this centurion soldier was worried about Jesus' reputation. He said, I'm not worthy that you should come underneath my roof. I'm not worthy, do not, do not. And he wanted, he said, he, he, he said, I'm not worthy that you should enter underneath my roof. I really think there was a state of being just humble and recognizing that. In verse seven, wherefore neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers, and I say unto one, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned him about, and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great a faith, no, not in Israel. And I think when we see this account of this great faith, this is the greatest faith that Jesus came across. As believers, we need to recognize, why was this man's faith so great? Remember, he said this is the greatest faith that he's seen in all of Israel. That was more than his disciples. That was more than the woman with the issue of blood where he said, your faith has made you whole. Remember the men that were let down through the roof? That's more than them. And he said, great is your faith when, when, when they let the man down. He said, your sins are forgiven. Why was this faith so great though? I, 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 and I started studying and I was like, I had these you know, articles that I was reading and it's like, because he was humble, because he recognized that Jesus could do this miracle and he was at a state where he was broken. And I said, it really just kind of sh shined on me. I think this is the closest account that we have in the gospels that someone was operating underneath the new covenant principles. What did he say? Just, just say the word and my servant will be healed, right? Just, just speak the word. I'm not worthy that you should come underneath my roof. Just say the word. He believed in his heart. He spoke with his mouth. Remember, righteousness in the heart, confessing with your mouth. And when, this, when Jesus saw that, he said, wow, great is your faith. Jesus had not gone to the cross and died. He is, he, he, his work wasn't complete yet, but he marveled and said, wow, how great is this man's faith? He wasn't, he, he wasn't a Jew. And remember, Jesus was sent to the house of the Jews. I just really think seeing this, you know, as this servant, you know, a centurion soldier was a head over a hundred soldiers. And then he had other servants in his house. You know, you think about this, when he sent people to Jesus, when he sent the rulers of the Jews to Jesus, you know, this was not a family member. This was a servant that he was wanting healed because he had palsy. Um, but this really just goes to show how God shows no partiality. God shows no favoritism to any man. God is, he says, if you have faith, that's the first thing that Peter said when he went to Cornelius' house. He said, God shows favoritism to no man. And whoever does righteousness and lives a godly life is accepted by him. Tell you what, we need our faith to rise up in Jesus Christ. He does not look at the outward appearance. He does not look at the things that define us in this, in this life. He looks at our heart and if we're obedient to him and pro proclaim the promises of God. This just goes to show how we need to speak the word. You know, I was th talking to uh, Steve and Gay there. Um, if you don't know Steve and Gay, they're um, two members of our church, an older couple. And Gay had... Um, a stroke in April. And so Steve was coming to talk to me and uh, when he talked to me, he said, you know, we knew what happened, but uh, there was no fear. We didn't ha have any fear. There was no fear. We trusted God completely and we just started speaking the word. I said, there's, there's an element that we need to get by this. Fear is wanting to enter in. But where we're so invested into God's word, we say, this is, I don't care. Paul got this. He said, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. He said, the sufferings of this world aren't to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed unto us. Paul knew. He said, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to depart to be with the Lord. 
but for me to be here with you is more needful. Paul, I think he could have ended his life any time that he wanted to, because if you know anything about Paul, he had a lot of enemies out there, and I guarantee it, he wanted to tell a couple of guys off. He's like, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go tell these guys off right now, tell them that they're gonna burn. <laughs> but uh, he said, for me to be here is more needful for you guys. And uh, you know, Paul, it says that he was beheaded just like John the Baptist. Isn't that amazing? Preach repentance, you're gonna get your head chopped off. But um, we're gonna continue to go with it. Um, so speaking the word, God is true, amen? He's given us all authority over the power of the enemy. He's given us all the tools that we need. And so as, as a church, we need to recognize that we're in a battle right now. I think this is one of the biggest reasons why people don't sign up to be a believer, if you wanna say it that way. And because we say it's going to be a bed of roses, come on over, you need to get your life fixed up, cleansed. And which that is true to a degree. Um, we, we need to endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. There is a race to run. And, you know, Paul says to Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. This is a fight. Remember, what does the shield do? The shield guards us, our body, and the arrows come in from the enemy. But when the shield's down, we're prey to the enemy. We need to get that shield back up, get back into the fight. There's too many believers that I see and I run into on a daily basis that they were in the fight, but they've gone back to the bunker. Man, we need you up on the front line. God has a plan for your life. He has a, he has a plan for your life and there's people that you're gonna touch. There's gonna be things that are gonna be really, really, really hard for you to do. And I believe some of the people here, we're gonna go through some hard, 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 difficult times. And we look at that and say, well, that's really bad, but you know, when, it, when it's tough, I always think about the challenges that I've faced through life and those challenges make up who I am today. I just thank God that these challenges, sometimes, you know, I ran from challenges. I disdained correction. I just, you know, pushed it aside, gave my life to the Lord and it was like, boom, 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 challenge, challenge, challenge. And I just, I say, man, how these, this, this, when the church is challenged, that's when we have growth as believers. When the church is challenged, we have growth, Amen. You know, I like that saying. It says, hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. Weak men create hard times. Tell you what, folks, we're at a time right now where weak men are creating hard times. We need to step up to the plate and be the men and women of God that he's called us to be. Amen. You think about James chapter one, verse two. He says in there, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Romans 5, 3 says, we glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. These things make us stronger. We need to get in the battle. There's a battle to fight. I know it, it, it's, it's, I, I, I completely get it. There's times where I'm like, man, I just feel so passive right now for my faith and, oh, Lord. But you know what? When I'm uncomfortable in my flesh and I'm comfortable in the spirit, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do amazing things when the spirit of the Lord is in me, directing me. I can speak to whoever I want to. I can witness. I can let my light shine. I can pray over people. We need to be expecting big things, amen? Amen. We are the children of God. And he said, get back in the fight. It's gonna be tough. But this is why we need co community with each other. This is why we need to lift each other up in the faith. Amen? So the third step I wanna talk about, the, the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto death. I know we're chiseling for time right now. Third step, they love not their lives unto death. Luke 14 gives us the criteria it's very sobering. And I, I say this because, you know, I'm gonna go listen to this sermon and, and hear myself say these things. It's gonna be convicting, but that's good because I need, I need something that's convicting me, telling me to get back into the race, pushing me to be the most I can be in Jesus Christ, amen? Verse 14, chapter 25, and there went great multitudes with him and he turned and said unto them, if any man come to me and hate not his father, mother, wife, children, brethren, and sisters, yea, even his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower sits not down first and counts the cost, whether he has 
sufficient funds to finish it. Lest happily, after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it began to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to war against another king sitteth not down first and consults whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him and 20,000? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a message and desires conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land, yet, ne- yet for the dunghill. But men cast it out. He, hath, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So I really get this. Is, there's an implication. We can start out strong in the Lord, but there's, as he says, the builder who sets to build and doesn't count the cost first, you know. So what does Jesus say? He says, whoever sets his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. I, mean, I know he's talking about falling away, but unfortunately, I'm, I'm you know, and I say this with, with gentleness and, and I, I don't mean to, to be, be really, really hard, but, you know, as I, I'm out sharing my faith or, you know, just through everyday life, sadly, many Christians that I run into have gone back to the world in a more sophisticated way. They've gone back to loving the world in a more sophisticated way. And, you know, we have the churches in Revelation, which I think is so dynamite, that we need as children of God to examine ourselves, whether we be in the faith. Say, you know what? I not only believe God for salvation, but I, I believe his word for healing. I believe it for every promise of God. I'm so invested into this, I count all things as rubbish, as foolishness, right? And that's what Paul was saying. I count everything as rubbish, foolishness, that I might gain Christ. So the church is in Revelation, you know, what does it say? The, the lukewarm church, he says, you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. He says to the, the loveless church, return back to your first love, Tell you what, folks, we need to turn back to our first love. I'm saying this to myself, but God is for us. And there's a victory that we're gonna see. And when we start operating in the spirit, getting out of the flesh, we'll see God work and he'll do mighty things in you and other people, amen? I just wanna, I know we're kind of crunching for time. I wanna finish this, but um, 2 Timothy 1, 7, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love, and of a sound mind. Amen? I'm jazzed up for what the Lord is going to do. I want to read a couple of accounts with you quick before we dismiss. Um, this is a book that my wife got me. It's probably one of the best books, probably one of the most convinced, uh, convicting books. It's, it's called Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's written by John Fox, and he lived in 1563. John Fox began writing a book to tribute Christian martyrs and its account of martyrs from the early church all the way to 2001. And one subject I hate studying is martyrs and, you know, medieval ages. It's just so dark and gruesome. But I've been really compelled to read this and it's, it's convicting and it's, but it pushes me, it encourages me that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Also in the church in Rome was a godly man named Lawrence who was a minister of the gospel and in charge of distributing the church's goods. This was underneath the eighth persecution under Emperor Valerian, if I'm saying that right. And Marcanus, the governor, greedily demanded that Lawrence, who was a minister, tell him where the church's riches were hid. Thinking he could take them for himself, Lawrence requested three days in which to gather the riches together and present them to the governor. When the third day came, Marcianus demanded that Lawrence keep his promise, whereupon Lawrence stretched out his arms over some poor Christians that he had gathered in place with him and said, these are the precious riches of Christ and of the church. They are the treasure in which faith in Christ reigns, in whom Christ has his dwelling place, what more precious jewel can the church have than those in whom Christ promised to dwell? Upon hearing this, Marcianus raged in the fury and madness of devils and screamed out his anger. Light the fire, do not spare the wood. This villain has tried to deceive the emperor. Away with him. 
Away with him, whip him with scourges, jerk him with hooks. Hit him with fists, brain him with clubs. Does this traitor joke with the emperor? Pinch him with fiery tongs, wrap him in burning plates. Bring out the strongest chains and the fire forks and the grated bed of iron. Put the bed on the fire and when it's red hot, bind the traitor on it hand and foot and roast him. Broil him, toss him, turn him, torment him in every way that you can or you yourselves will be tormented yourself. No sooner had he finished ranting than the tortures began. After many cruel torments, this meek slave of Christ was laid on his fiery bed. But in God's providence, it was a bed of soft feathers and the godly Lawrence laid there and perished as if taking a nourishing rest. Amazing. These guys were so invested into God. I think about that, I'm like, my goodness. Like, that's extreme. But you know what? There's a lot of stuff on the horizon. This is another one. Romian, Romanus, if I'm saying that right, was a deacon of the church in Caesarea. There arrested, he was taken to Antioch where he was condemned for his faith. Scourged, racked, torn with hooks, cut with knives in his body and face, his teeth beaten out, his hair plucked from his head, and then strangled to death. Eulalia, here's another account, was a remarkable sweet young lady of a Spanish Christian family When she was arrested for being a Christian, the civil officer tried to convert her to paganism. But she so ridiculed the pagan gods that he was enraged and ordered her to be tortured with the greatest severity. During her torture, hooks were inserted into her sides and then pulled through the flesh, and her breasts were burned until they were charred. Her pain was so great from this that she died. This was in December 303. I think about this and I don't want that to be on a sorry note because it it's, it's really is gruesome when you start thinking about it. But what I want this for us is to be an encouragement that if they were so invested into this that they're willing to die for their faith, we need to be also. Let's not lower the bar. Let's raise it up. Let's be the thermostat in the room instead of the thermometer, amen? And let the Lord Jesus be our guide and direction. I pray that you guys got something from this this morning and I pray that this was encouraging to know that you guys have a plan for your life and I just thank you all for letting me share with you. This was on my heart this morning and I pray that God would just continue to encourage you. Um, This morning, before we leave, I know that you guys are wanting to go. Um, If we could just get the men up to the front right now because I, I felt that we need to pray over the men because there's a call of God on your life there really is. If we could get Kodiak to come up here and we get Pastor Harlow and Pastor Craig as well. But we just want to pray over all the men of this church because I'm very thankful that there's men at this church because you guys are all, we're all in it together. So if the men want to just come line it right up here and ladies, you guys can stretch out your arms to them um, or you can come up and pray.